Hey everyone, welcome to the Tension Podcast, where we acknowledge that most of life and faith is lived in the tension between the two extremes. On this show, we're going to take a look at what many of us were taught growing up in evangelical churches, weigh it against what our current culture is saying, and try to find what Jesus has for us in the tension between the two. If we haven't met, my name is Jonathan Crone, and we're joined as always by our co-host, Mr. Eric Williams. Eric, go ahead and say hey to the people. Now, I think we've covered a lot of like controversial issues. Um, this may be one that uh, is the most controversial, but if you're listening to this year, look, because Jonathan and I, well, I'm going to sit by while Jonathan solves this problem for you and gives you a definitive answer on you know, the way to fix <laughs> one of society's biggest problems. Yeah. I mean, when we were planning this season, I wanted to get to this one. This one was a hard one to write. I don't know if anyone's going to listen to this one. So we, we will see if this format change works when it comes to this episode. If people listen, then we know it works. If people don't listen, then uh, I don't know what we do. Yep. Yeah, well, uh, we'll we'll see. And this might be another one of those where, like, uh, you're going to listen for a little bit and then you'll tune out at a certain point or turn it off, which, okay, whatever. I think if we stick to the outline we have, I think we're going to be pretty fair today. But uh, who knows? What, what we think is fair may not be what you think is fair. But to introduce what we're talking about today, if you're listening to this as it comes out, this week is the three-year anniversary of the George Floyd murder that set off the racial tensions of 2020. In response to that, we saw two camps in our society that have always been there, but they kind of sprung forth in ways that were more vitriolic than in the past. On one side, you had the back of the blue crowd, and that is the side that backs the police no matter what. They always take the default position is the police were okay, they didn't do anything wrong, we're going to back the blue. Every benefit of the doubt goes to the police regardless of what happened. And then on the other extreme, what was that? Qualified immunity. Qualified immunity, yep. On the other side of the extreme, you had the all cops are bad crowd. That started getting more and more and more play. Uh, If you ever seen the hashtag ACAB, that's what that means. This Hmm. is the side that says police of any nature. The, this, this, the B doesn't necessarily mean bad. It means all cops are rhymes with, uh, which no, all cops are, uh, let's see what rhymes, what rhymes with, uh, you might have, which one are you going with? with? What rhymes with bastards? Oh, okay. Okay. Fair. Whatever. Dis- disasters? disasters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah rhymes. Yeah. Okay. So if you need to cut it, rhymes with disaster. Disasters. <laughs> okay. I actually don't think I've heard that one. I always yeah. just, uh, you know, I don't, okay. I learned something new today. We're a few minutes mm-hmm. into this and look at me learning new things. But this side of the coin thinks that police of any nature, that they are inherently bad and that policing is beyond redemption. There is no such thing as a good cop to the people who fall on this side of the coin. But we believe those two camps are the extreme and that we are called by scripture to live in between those two extremes. So today what we're going to do is we're going to briefly look at each one of the extremes, but then we're going to spend most of our time talking about the tension that we believe scripture calls us to live in. So Eric, the first side of the extreme here is the black, the blue plus thin blue line, that type of crowd where all cops are always the good guys. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there that you hear the bad apples. Uh, um, I, I guess it would be, that would be like, okay, we're going to admit sometimes there are bad apples, but those are isolated bad actors and we just need to get them out. Um, or, you, you know, you'll hear like the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun and cops are always the good guys with a gun. And that's the only way that you could stop them. And that thin blue line, um, is, is protecting, you know, it, it really, it comes from, uh, from a, a British, uh, battle. And I think the 1850s or something like that, where there was like a thin red line of, of, uh, military members that were protecting against an overwhelming foe. And so that's been kind of co-opted here in the last hundred years. Cause I think it came out of uh, the 1950s in LA where it was, where the, uh, the police chief talked about the cops being the thin blue line that protects society from 
the bad part of society. So this this is it. That means that you're always they're always the hero. There there's no systematic racism. There's no unfair power structures. There's nothing bad within the system. Any problems that you have with police, those are isolated individuals that are the problem. And this side of the coin thinks that we should back the police no matter what. In all situations, back the blue because they're putting their lives in danger for us and they deserve our support. Yep. And so because and that of that, would be the, that's the extreme side. And I know, yes. you know, again, even the person who's like the most extreme version of back the blue, they will still probably say, well, I mean, like there are certain cases, but you'll never name a case. Right. Or when push comes to shove, you will default to this is a, you know, we need to give the police the benefit of the doubt, no matter what in every situation. And also that's where you have that thin blue line of uh, silence or of secrecy where, um, you don't rat on other cops and you the don't, police, you don't the, ever point the wall of silence. Yeah, the wall of silence. You're not going to call out other cops. You're not going to, you know, they're not going to quote unquote police their own either. So there is a sense of like, we've got to protect. It's a very, um, traditionally unionized mentality of like, we're going to protect everyone, even the bad apples, um, in practice, even if they wouldn't say it in, in, you know, in talk. Yep. And again, just if you're new to the show, if this is your first week, we start off by talking about the extremes. There are variances of this all the way up to the middle, and then there are variances the other way until we get to the extremes. But we like to point out the extremes so we can find what that middle ground looks like. Yep. Many of the people who are on the far side of this black, back the blue idea, they find any type of criticism of the police or our power structures in America they see that as wokeness or being indicative of being a progressive, any type of criticism whatsoever means you're, they equate that with being the other side of the extreme, which is the all cops are bad extreme. So if you have any type of criticism in their mind, you think all cops are bad. Yeah. And that's, and, and that's really what I love about uh, our new format, but essentially what we've been talking about the whole time is, is this idea of like you, um, Forget, I forget what the overall terminology is, but it's like you have to, if you uh, adopt one side, you have to subscribe to it all. And so that's that's the issue because it's easy to turn around and vilify anyone who's going to kind of cross that thin blue line and say, well, hey, maybe we do need to make some adjustments here. May, you know, Can we see some of the, the problems that seem to be systemic either – in our society, in our police state, or even with police officers themselves. I mean, if you look at the, the rates of domestic violence, if you look at the rates of uh, substance abuse, if you look at the rates of even things of like self-harm and suicide, something would say that there's th that everything's not like kosher and good in the police, uh, in police world, we'll just say that. Then when you take it to the far extreme, the op opposite direction, the all cops are bad, we won't use uh -huh. the other word here. Yep. Um, this side of the extreme believes every police officer is bad. They believe that the system is totally 100% corrupt and that every law is made to protect the police and not the people. They believe that policing is beyond redemption and that the entire system needs to be torn down and recreated from scratch. This is a group that would like, you know, talk about uh, the derogatory terminology for police officers, all police, they're pigs, they're bacon, you know, all this sort of things, bootlickers, all, I mean, like if you think through no matter what, and what's interesting about this side is it kind of, it, it covers a wider range, I think on the political spectrum, you know what I mean? Because like even the ACAB acronym with the expletive deleted at the end, that saying originated from like UK in the UK in the, you know, skinhead movements and things like that. So that's even on, on a side that's like, I don't know that everybody in the ACAB mentality would identify with, but there's a wide range of like, if you think about an, anyone from the hardened criminal side to someone who is an extreme progressive, all of that would be, uh, you know, w would be within this, this type of, of mentality and thought. Well, you and think of the all, the outlaw country type of mentality. Mm -hmm. The uh, I I think I mean, I'm in North Carolina, so I think back to the moonshiners and yep. the start of NASCAR and all of that. Yep. Those are traditionally like anti-government mm -hmm. type of 
viewpoints that yeah. would probably would probably be labeled traditionally conservative, right. that, but they they dislike the government, so they think all right. police are bad in that form because they are actors for the state. Yep. So and this, they call so this all cops are bad. Go ahead. So then they would call themselves libertarians, right? Because there's the, here's the things that I identify with on the progressive side is I don't I don't like the police state. I don't want people in my business. I don't ever think that, but I'm still conservative. So like you even have that group of like libertarian who would consider themselves libertarians because they they are anti anti policing anti anyone in the government getting involved in my personal view and my personal life. And so I, I think if we were to like dial it back from the extreme where the ACAB um, crowd comes from is this idea uh, if, we're, if we're again, dialing it back from the extreme version is like, uh, yeah, there are bad apples, but it, you know, it's kind of like you can't separate those out if the system is designed to protect them. So because you're still in a system designed to protect bad apples and you are supporting that system, the entire system is bad. So if you are, you know, their belief, um, again, would be along the lines of like, if you're a police officer that's, that sits behind the wall of silence, you are complicit as well. Therefore you are a rhymes with disaster. <laughs> So one of the things I want to point out is that traditionally the two sides of this coin have not necessarily been conservative versus progressive in our mm. current culture's definitions. That has kind of changed as culture has changed. And another thing I want to point out before we get moving is the defund the police thing that came out of the George Floyd murder murders as well. That yeah. is not the same camp as the all cops are bad crowd completely. And the way I would describe this is everyone in the all cops are bad crowd falls into the defund crowd, but not all defund the police think that all cops are bad. So there is, it's a less extreme version of that, that has terrible messaging and marketing and doesn't actually describe what they want by their name but I don't want you to get those two completely confused because there is some nuance there. And, and, but the problem is the back, the blue and thin blue line crowd would group those two groups together Correct. Yep. because the, it's very easy. Um, what's happening here in our political discourse is a lot of straw manning. So somebody might come out and say, uh, Hey, here's what I believe. I believe that we should be providing more resources for alternative forms of, of policing and proactive measures needed to reduce the number of deadly interactions between police and individuals to reduce the number of, you know, mental health related problems to reduce the, that sort of amount. So therefore we need to defund some of the policing in order to fund some of these other things. Now, for me, that's a very reasonable conversation. I'm like, great. Okay. Let's talk about the nuances involved. Let's talk about the tension between that. But if you are a hardcore back the blue line and you're going, oh, you want to defund the police and you see all these like memes and, and straw man arguments of like, great, go ahead and send a social worker into someone who's in a domestic dispute with a gun. Let's see what happens if they're going to like, you know, uh, gentle parent these people down. And you're like, oh, my God, can't, you don't want to live in the tension is what you're saying. You don't want anything involved in a nuanced conversation because you don't care about. You don't care about understanding the other side. You just want to vilify them to justify your own beliefs. And then on the other side, if you're like, hey, you know, you, you're you complaining about the thin blue line of the wall of silence and you have no understanding or empathy for the mental impact and emotional impact every single day for a police officer that when they get into their car and when they go out, they may not be coming home or they may be witnessing some very, very traumatizing and tragic situations. You know, you just think that, that all they are, they're just guys and, and men and women that have no feelings and, and will just all they want some power and all those things. Yeah, right. Exactly. Which isn't and it's true. like, you don't, you don't want a nuanced discussion either. So that's why I think we need to live in the tension here. Okay. So let's spend the rest of our time talking about that tension and I don't know that this will go long today. If it does, um, I apologize on the front end, but we're going to try to be, be brief, but there's a lot for us to get to here. And that's because this is an important conversation that I'm willing to bet most of us who grew up in white evangelical churches have never actually had. 
And we mentioned this a couple weeks ago, how one of the issues in our society is we go to secondary sources instead of studying the things for ourselves. And so I want to admit on the front end, Eric and I are really like a tertiary source today because we're using a secondary source to talk to you based on someone who is a New Testament scholar who did the research himself. So at some point, you have to go back and study these things for yourself. I want to make sure you know that. We're not going to dive into the nuts and the bolts of scripture today because we simply don't have time. We're going to focus primarily on application and applied theology as opposed to where we got that theology. So I want to say that on the front end for those who are wanting me to use more scripture and to, to point back to scripture. This is all based in scripture, but we only have so much time. So I just want to throw that disclaimer out on the front end. And what we're going to be talking about today, I have to give full credit to Dr. Esau McCauley, who uh, is an Anglican priest. He's an associate professor of New Testament at Wheaton College. He writes for the New York Times and a bunch of other publications. But he wrote a book called Reading While Black, which is a look at scripture from a black perspective that I read in the wake of George Floyd as I was trying to educate myself on a lot of these issues because I come from a town that is 93% white and voted 78% conservative in the last presidential election. So I did not grow up around this perspective. I wanted to hear this perspective. Not only does um, Dr. McCauley have those like credentials, but he also has an MDiv from Gordon Conwell and a PhD in New Testament from St. Andrews, where he was supervised by Eric. You may have heard of this guy, uh, mm -hmm. N.T. Wright. You, you heard of him before? Friend of the show. <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. So yeah, I, a, he's an actual, to, actual friend of the show. I mean, I guess he's not a friend, not on our side. It's like, but it's like, uh, like I used to in kindergarten, I got in an argument with a friend uh, where I was like, oh, you know, you're my friend. And he's like, oh, uh, I may be your friend, but you're not my friend. And we're like back and forth. So that's kind of how it is with NT, right? It's like, he's our friend, but he doesn't know. He has no clue we exist. No, that's okay. So the reason I give Dr. McCauley's background, his credentials is because I want you to see that he's not some hyper progressive theologian. So he is not coming from this, from a progressive Christianity side of thing, but he's someone who has studied and has been trained at some of the best Christian schools through some of the best theologians. So as we give you this background, that's where this is coming from. Okay. Got the disclaimers out of the way. So hopefully we're on the same page as we move forward. But in his book, there's a chapter called Freedom, Freedom is No Fear, The New Testament and a Theology of Policing. I had never heard a theology of policing before reading this book. And in it, he writes about Romans 13 verses 1 through 7. And he uses that as a jumping off point to talk about evil rulers throughout the history of the Bible. And while we don't have time to get into those weeds, one of the big ideas I picked up from his writing is that the New Testament speaks more to the idea of power structures and the way the systems are set up than it does the individual actions of individual police officers. And here's the example that he gives. In Romans 13, 3 and 4, it is the state's attitude, not the soldier or officer as a vocation, that stands at the center of Paul's concerns. Stated differently, Paul recognizes that the state has a tremendous influence on how the soldier or officer treats its citizens. Thus, if there is to be a reform, it must be structural and not merely individualistic. And I think that's one of the places we have to start at when we think of this tension between policing and justice. Yeah. And I, I, I think that there's um, an, another piece that we need to consider as well is that as we're reading through the Bible and you see these things, especially in the time of Paul and Jesus, you know, which overlapped, um, they, there were not, there weren't police you know, th there was military members who were also police officers and they were very much overlapping, which is, you know, another thing that Macaulay points out is there's, there's an overlap there. And when we can't pull those two apart and examine them, we, you know, we get into an issue just in, in general with how this works out. Because again, the system that Paul was referring to when he's referring to things in the New Testament 
is one of a militarized police state where the military is the police. And when you're thinking about early, you know, Judea or, you know, the, the, the region of Palestine, anything in that area, it's like they were under a police regime because it was a separate type of, you know, society. I don't you want to call them country, but it was, it was the Jews and the Gentiles that were under the control of Rome. We're not talking this is the state of North Carolina that happens to be in a combined United States. This is very much oppressors in military walking around, and that's who that's what the system was designed for. Yeah, and one way to think about this is not every soldier was a police officer, but the people who did the policing were always soldiers. Yes. So you have to think about it in those terms. That's why... Dr. McCauley writes soldier slash officer so often Mm -hmm. because the officer was a soldier who was tasked to do the role of policing. Yes. Which in our conversation, your ACAB or, you know, the smaller subset of defund the police is going, yes, look at all the money being spent to militarize our police in the system. You know, like my, my small, my small suburb uh, has a SWAT team. That's got a, you know, a, uh, armored personnel carrier for, our, and I'm sure, I'm sure, again, I'm sure they need it for something, right? And they assist with our larger metropolitan area all the time and all that. Great. So I'm not making a comment on that, but more so of, along the lines of like, you see more and more now police have these militarized pieces of equipment. And so there is some of this overview that again, are the the one extreme of ACAB or, or the smaller subset that says defund the police is going, see, CCC. Yep. 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 Right there. Right there. Right there. See, what's that? Uh, uh, that meme with, uh, with, <laughs> with Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> right there. He sees it, right. They're pointing that out to us. And one of the things that Dr. McCauley says that, that points out in that passage that I just read is he says, thus, if there is to be a reform, it must be structural and not merely individualistic. And one of the things that we mentioned this in past episodes, We're going to do an entire episode about it later this year, but it's become a theme of this season that we didn't really plan on, but it keeps popping its head up, is that this idea of the collective whole versus the individual. And in our culture, we are very individualistic. We are not very collective. So we like to think that it's bad actors. It's just one thing. It's not a system. Whereas in this passage in Romans, it's the state's attitude, it's the systems, it's the collective whole that is the issue that must be taken on, not just the individual police officers. Yeah, and that is a typical, you know, and this is this is kind of my, we talked off air, but this is my thesis in this whole thing is it's very difficult when Christians, when you have aligned your political viewpoint with your religious viewpoint. And in some cases, I would argue you use your religious viewpoint to justify your political viewpoint. And that's more important to you. The typical Republican. Hang on, you, said say, that backwards. you said that backwards. They use their political viewpoint to justify their religious. You said they use their religious to. Which one do I mean? You mean that they have a political opinion and then they use the Bible to justify the politics as yeah. opposed to what we want them to do is use their religion to them impact influence yeah yeah so like you you said it backwards so whatever it whatever way you want to take it this is the the crux is the sliding scale here of what should adjust is your political viewpoint your religious viewpoint is is stable of like okay here this is where i come from religiously that means on this issue i might be a little bit more conservative on this issue might i might be more progressive you know blue here red here vice versa so but what ends up happening is we come to the our, we come to the discussion holding our political views tight-fisted and then we're kind of like oh let's manipulate the scripture and the theology to adapt to this so republicans or traditional conservatives who are very much uh, in the camp of like individual responsibility would point to these systems and say it's not a system issue because people are the problem it's a sin issue and you can't legislate morality. You can't legislate around the sin issue. While at the same time, 
they're like, oh, let's ban these things because they're sinful and dangerous. So there's this this weird piece of like we can't look at the system when it comes to the things that we care about because, oh, those are people and those are sin issues of their heart. And Jesus needs to get into their 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 heart and adjust them. Not we don't need to create a law around this while at the same time, again, going, like, oh, no, we need to outlaw drag shows. Or we need to do these things because they're sinful and wrong. So that's where it's like if we could separate if you could separate out your your political viewpoint from your theology just for a second, then we can have this discussion but we need to start by saying, hey, there's some things inherent in the system that need to be kind of evaluated, which is what Paul or uh, what Macaulay is saying Paul is saying. Yes. And I think it's important for us to again point out we are a tertiary source here. We're taking something that someone else has said and we're using it to pass it on because I think it's important for us to start there with that idea. But in the passage in Romans 13, Paul focuses more on the structure of policing than he does individual officers. And I think that's part of the framework we need to follow as we live in this tension. We can back the blue and support good police officers while also calling out systemic issues that lead to situations where bad officers can thrive and not be called out. So this is a quote, again, another quote from Dr. McCauley that I want to read to you because I think it sums up this idea. He says, the government that created the structures has some responsibility to see those wrongs righted and injustices undone. Furthermore, if the power truly resides with the people in a democratic republic, then the Christian's first responsibility is to make sure that those who direct the sword in our culture direct that sword in ways in keeping with our, the Christian's values. We can and must hold elected officials responsible for the collective actions of the agents of the state who act on our behalf. Yeah. Man, doesn't that sound like personal responsibility, right? Doesn't that sound like from the cons- from what I was brought up to believe as a conservative like that is personal responsibility. That is, you need to take personal responsibility and be accountable for yourself and hold others accountable. But if you can't separate your conservative evangel- evangelicalism from your conservative Republican- republicanism, it's impossible to objectively evaluate those policies and objectively evaluate the policy makers and trying to hold them accountable. Because like, think about in the last, I don't know, eight to 10 years of our political situation. Christians can't come out, you know, typically conservative Christians can't come out and say, hey, you know what? Uh, I don't agree with Donald Trump's morality there because like all of a sudden now we open ourselves up or they open themselves up for scrutiny. It's like, no, 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 no. It's okay. We can, we can, you know, we can wash over some of these things that we see that are wrong because man, if we open the door any bit to any sort of scrutiny in one aspect of our political beliefs, the whole thing comes crashing down. But what I love about what Macaulay is saying here, you know, is like we can we can evaluate the individual pieces of the whole. So if you say, hey, this one policy is not good, you're not burning down the entire platform. If you say, hey, this one um, this this one police officer needs to be blacklisted from being a police officer, period. We're not saying you can't make a living or she can't make a living somewhere, but they just can't make a living somewhere where they have a gun and the authority to do the things that they're doing like. Yes, that should be common sense, and that should be something that a rational person who can live in the tension can have that conversation over. But for some reason, when you have married your politics with your theology, that's not possible. The Christian's first responsibility is to make sure that those who direct the sword in our culture direct that sword in ways in keeping with our values. To me, when I read that, it reinforces the idea that if we're going to be influential in our government, then our role is to make sure that the people we elect and the people who are elected, even that we disagree with, that they keep the values we hold important. And if we say we are pro-life, 
if we say that we value everyone because they're made in the image of God, then we have to look at our policies, both from a big picture governmental legal standpoint, as well as the systemic just training issues for how officers are trained and the the types of tactics they are taught, we have to look at those and say, hey, do these things that are being taught align with what I say I believe that every human is made in the image of God and that every life actually matters? Mm -hmm. If they don't align with those ideas, then we need to be pushing for different types of training and tactics so that, and we'll get into this in a little bit, so that every life truly can matter and every life can be protected by the state and the police who represent that state. I think it also comes down to evaluating our own hearts too, you know, in that discussion. Uh, because if you were to see the footage from even just this year in January in the city of Memphis, right? 29 year old man, last name Nichols, he was beaten to death by five police officers. And in that video, his last words, he's calling out for his mom. Like he's calling out for his mom. And like, if you see the George Floyd video and what he's calling out for, it's like, you, you can, whatever the situation is and calling out for like, what was justified and what wasn't, let's not even talk about that. But if you look at that and your first reaction is knee jerk, defend the police or your first reaction is to call that person a thug or a criminal. Or if there's any bit in you as a Christian that says this individual deserved what was coming to them, that is a very hard heart line to align yourself with and saying that every person matters to God and every life is valuable. And like, if you put empathy aside in that situation, or if you can't take a look at these situations with an empathetic viewpoint as a Christian and say that was a life that mattered to God and separate that out from needing just to justify and go, Oh, but you know, the individual that killed them was justified in that. Like we don't need to go into that discussion, but I think it's important. The first step for some of us is to evaluate our own personal reactions when those things happen. And so whether you want to call it George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery or any of these situations that have happened in the past, and I know Ahmaud Arbery wasn't directly with police, but any time where there is someone that is killed and you actually get to see and hear the video, and if that doesn't do something to you that says, ah, that's a tragedy, then I, I think that's an indication something's wrong. Yeah, and that actually, I don't know if you meant to do this, but that directly leads to the next quote from Reading While Black that I wanted to get to, so thank you for the transition. But Dr. McCauley writes, as participants in a free society, we have the ability to shape public opinion about what crime is and how criminals should be viewed. Hmm. Think about that. How, what crime is and how criminals should be viewed. He goes on. We can create a society where those who are suspected of breaking the law are treated as image bearers worthy of respect. A Christian theology of policing then must grow out of a Christian theology of persons. This Christian theology of policing must remember that the state is only a steward or caretaker of persons. It did not create them, and it does not own nor define them. God is our creator, and he will have a word with those who attempt to mar the image of God in any person. We are being the Christians God called us to. We are being the Christians God called us to be when we remind the state of the limits of its power. And there's a couple pieces in there that I want to pick apart. The first is that idea of we have the ability to shape public opinion about what crime is and how criminals should be viewed. Eric, you just mentioned this, but if our first response to when there is some type of police brutality is, well, what did the person do to deserve that? As opposed to, oh man, an image of God was just beaten, was just killed, was just shot, was just whatever. Then we've got to check our heart there. 
because if we're first trying to see what that person did to deserve it, as opposed to first being grieved that a life that is made in the image of God is taken, then that is something in us. If we are truly pro-life because all lives matter and we are all created in the image of God, if that's truly what we're saying here, then we should first look at the idea of that person should not have had to experience that regardless of what they did. And that is sad and a tragedy that that happened. We can then talk later, was it justified? That's a secondary down the line conversation. Only after we have taken the time to grieve what has happened to someone who has been made in the image of God. Yeah, and that's another filter and indication. If you jump right to, well, what did they do to deserve it? Well, and even more so to the labels, murderer, thief, thug, whatever you want to call it, you know, use those different words that you use to justify making them less than human. If you're jumping to that, that's an indication that maybe your theology and your politics are too closely aligned. So I would say something else, and this is for church leaders. Oh, and I, I guess everybody, but as someone who's given messages and sermons in a church before, if you stand up there and if you look back in your catalog of messages that you've ever given or as a Christian that you've heard and you love and you repeat and you yes and amen to and you highlight and you, you know, all that, make all the notes and post on social media down. If that message of like, uh, God doesn't see you as a liar. God doesn't see you as a cheater. He sees you as an image of God. If you can say those words or say amen to that scripture or I mean, that sermon and then walk outside and point at someone else and say, ah, well, you know what? George Floyd, he was a drug addict and a thug. Guess what? That That is a hypocritical statement. That is That is just wrong. You cannot say, Hey, let's everybody in this room, you know, when we're talking about our sin and everything like that, and God doesn't see you as that. And he sees you as this, and you're a new creation and you're whatever else like that. And you're a child of God and you're singing, I am a child of God. Right. And then you go out and you're pointing at others and you're saying, well, that person was a thug. That person was, a, you know, a whatever you want to say. It's, it, it's essentially like the man who was owed a debt. The debt was forgiven and then turned right around and expected the debt that he had for, from somebody else to be paid. It's like, Jesus has something to say about that. And you need, you need to check your heart on it. The other part of this line of thinking that I like with what Dr. McCauley said, he said, God is our creator and he will have a word for those who attempt to mar the image of God in any persons. We are being the Christians God called us to be when we remind the state of the limits of its power. That quote, remind the state of the limits of its power, is a very traditionally conservative mindset. Yeah. That is oh, a yeah. very libertarian mindset. Yep. So if we want to be Christians who live in this tension between backing the blue, backing the actual officers, and supporting or advocating for justice— then we are being the Christians God called us to be when we remind the state of the limits of its power. Mm -hmm. That is like how that idea of, Hey, the state did something wrong here. They shouldn't be doing this. How that became something that conservative Christians cannot do on the topic of policing. The way we made that jump is amazing to me that we got there because Traditionally, conservative evangelical Christians in America have been anti-government. And is the, it is the government that creates the systems that bad cops operate under. And it is those systems that allow the bad cops to thrive. So if we truly want to back the good police officers, and we're going to get into more of them in a second, part of that is holding the state accountable for the systems put in place that allow the bad officers to not only exist, but to thrive in many cases. We should be the ones advocating the loudest and the strongest for when the systems are against the humanity of people. Yeah. And that's the thing for me. And I mean, you, 
everybody listening, if you listen a long time, you probably get this already for how I feel. But it's like I can respect an opposing view as long as you maintain logical and rational consistency with that view. And so the amount of times that we put up with this cognitive dissonance in our viewpoints is just crazy to me. And so like this, this is that thing where you cannot think through your theological position without without divorcing it from your political affiliation. Because like you said, conservatives, they're against big government. I know you said they're against they're anti-government, which again, some people are like, no, I'm not anti-government, blah, blah, blah. Okay. They're against big government. They want reduced government. And so when somebody they want on the other government side, so small they can stick it in their pocket. Right. So when somebody else says, hey, you know what? Maybe we should uh, lower some of the funding for some of our government programs. Yes. Uh, let's start with um, s- some police. No. You know, it's like, oh, okay. So what is it here? And then on the other side, it's like because of our political discourse recently with the conservatives and being someone who has traditionally voted Republican, I will just tell you all that traditionally voted Republican and continue to in certain situations as well. It's like, how have we gone from Republicans and conservatives having a political platform with actual platform ideas to now, um, as of this recording, basically the conservative platform is owning the libs or anything that's anti-progressive. And so now once the, 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 the left comes out or the liberals say, Hey, you know, maybe we need to address policing in the system. And it's like, no, 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 no. These former like small government conservatives all of a sudden become police state supporting conservatives that say, you know, we need to elevate the power of police when it's like that conflicts with your core belief politically. And as we're saying here, theologically, we need to evaluate it as well because we need to rem- remember that the police work for us and not the other way around. This is another example of why I think deconstruction is so important mm. because many of us have our beliefs that we think politically and we have our beliefs that we think religiously and we have combined the two and we don't recognize the places that they conflict with each other. Right. And when I went through my time where I rethought everything I thought I knew, before I realized that was what deconstruction is. I realized there were things that I thought politically that did not match up with what I thought religiously. Right. Based on my culture and what I was raised in. Mm -hmm. And I had to figure out how to marry those two things. And because I valued my faith more than my political affiliation, it changed how I thought about many things. This is one of those topics that was changed. I realized that people being an image, being made in the image of God mattered more than supporting the systems of the police or supporting the capital P police, the organization and uh, the industry of policing. I realized that supporting the people on the ground was more important than that. Well, and it takes a lot of emotional maturity for you to be able to say, uh, you know, think about all the different categories that you represent. I'm white, you know, for you, you know, you're, you're white, con- conservative, evangelical, male, right? Uh, middle class-ish from the South. You know, it's like, how many of those things can you separate out and go like, just because you are in the South with a Baptist or, or charismatic upbringing, you can, can you say, oh, that doesn't mean that's also the same as the conservative religious, you know, Republican political platform. And I think that's a a necessary piece of deconstruction that every single Christian needs to go through no matter what is what things do I need to pull out and say, does my, um, does my Americanism define my Christianity? Are those one and the same? Does my identity as being a Southerner define my Christianity or, you know, a country folk define my Christianity, you know, whatever it looks like to say, does my, my affiliation as even being married and having kids define my Christianity? We've talked about that before, where we elevate marriage and we elevate parenthood and we elevate this and we downplay singlehood and we downplay people that don't have kids. It's like, you need to separate, you need to deconstruct those things before you can approach these situations with any set of objectivity or intellectual, uh, you know, honesty. And we've spent a lot of time talking about systemic things, which typically falls to the 
all cops are bad side because they would say the system is bad and they're the ones that, so we need to focus on the system. So if, if you're still hanging out with us and you're more on the back, the blue side, I want you to hear this piece because there is a piece of this where we do back the police officer. And this is the last passage I'm going to share from Dr. McCauley in reading while black, but he wrote, if Paul spoke to the power of the state and the sword, the Baptist turned his eye toward the individual soldier. He called them not to heroic feats of physical bravery, but to heroic virtue. He reminded them that their power need not turn them into villains who exploit. They could become champions for the weak. A Christian theology of policing then looks to the state and calls it to remember its duties. It looks to the officer and demands that said officer recognize the tremendous responsibility and the potential of the work that they do. When I think of the best police officers I know, I, so some of you may know this, some of you may not. I do PA announcing and music for my high school baseball team. Tonight, as we record this, we're having first responders night. So mm -hmm. we're going to have police officers there. When I think to the police officers that I know that will be there, the ones who are the best ones I know, they do exactly what this passage says. They truly protect and serve. They're not looking to cause problems. They're not viewing people as the problems that they are. They're not, they're not trying to see somebody and say, hey, has that person done something wrong? They're viewing people without biases and looking at them as human beings first, operating not with physical bravery, heroic feats of physical bravery, although they will if needed, but their standard modus of operation is heroic virtue. And that's the level we need to be holding our police officers to. And when they do that, when they, I, I think to the, to the men in the Nashville school shooting, the heroic virtue that it took for those police officers to run into that school and do what they did. Yeah. My God, we need to celebrate those people because that's heroic virtue that it, not only was it physical bravery, it was heroic bravery, but the virtue that took to set aside their, their natural desires to protect themselves, to go protect others. I will celebrate and back those blue men all day long because that's they're doing what they're supposed to do. So I think hopefully if you're listening, if you're 45 minutes into this and you're listening, you're starting to get the idea like the system has some issues, but when the officers, when they portray heroic virtue, then let's celebrate them and back them fully and cheer them on for exactly what they should be doing. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Cause I think you can, you, so you've probably hear this all the time in messages too, if you're a Christian or if you're a former Christian or where, wherever you're at on the journey, right. Is this idea that um, any, and being, being in the, in a group that used to plan sermon series and, and help, help pastors give talks. It's like, you always come across a time where it's like, Hey, we need more volunteers. We need more people to serve. We need to talk about their purpose. But we still emphasize like you can do ministry in your workplace. And so there's always like we need more Christian teachers. We need more Christian nurses. We need more Christian this and more Christian that because they're the ones doing the ministry in those areas. And by God, we need Christian police officers, people who view their policing as a ministry. And so like just like you, I mean, you know where, where you're at. Uh, I'm, I'm heavily involved in my CrossFit gym, um, uh, which is like, if you, where, who's hanging out there, first responders, <laughs> police officers, right? Like all these, this uh, veterans, military members. So it's like, yes, I I'm around these people all the time that I look up to and I go, not only are they, they brave and they have that bravery to walk into work every day, knowing that they may not come home. They may not come home. Okay. And that the things they are going to see are, are going to be that would completely disgust and shock and, and devastate other people. Number one, but two, the people that walk in there and they look and say, hey, my, my job, even if they're not Christian, they're like, my job is, is, is a ministry. My job is to serve others. My job is to help and see how I can positively influence the community. Not all of them are like that, obviously, but the ones that are, that's the one that need to be elevated. Now, in this conversation, and I put this in the notes because I want to talk about it. The thing that we need to be pointing out on the other side is calling out the bad apples, calling out yes. those inconsistencies, 
And so one thing that you see that has come up in the last, I mean, I think when I did some research on this started in 2007, but really picked up in like 2015 is this idea of the thin blue line mixed with the Punisher logo, which comic book fans, like, you know what that is, but it's like, it's the skull. If you look at the, the little, like half the skull with no bottom jaw, and then like a thin blue line going through it. And like anyone who knows comic books, you, you got to go, this is a problem. And I think, uh, they're, they're, <laughs> like, was it Nashville or was Tennessee or something like that? They had a bunch of Punisher logos on their cop cars. And then there was up uproar backlash from people that knew that, like, hey, the Punisher was an outlaw that was anti-police. And in fact, here, I got these lines. This is, this is from Marvel Comics Punisher number 14. I'll only say this once. This is the Punisher talking. I'll only say this once. He's talking to cops. We are not the same. You took an oath to uphold the law. You help people. I gave that up a long time ago. You don't do what I do. Nobody does. You boys need a role model. His name is Captain America, and he'd be happy to have you. Uh, the Punisher himself is saying, do not get a tattoo of the Punisher with a blue, thin blue line on it. Do not do that. So anybody who's out there that wants to be a law enforcement officer, again, I'm not law enforcement. I understand that there are things that you get that I don't get. Look to Captain America as your role model, not the Punisher. In fact, Jerry Conway is one of the Punisher creators. He said, when cops put Punisher skulls on their cars or members of the military wear Punisher skull patches, they're basically saying they're siding with the enemy of the system. Whether you think the Punisher is justified or not, whether you admire his code of ethics, he's an outlaw, he's a criminal. Police should not be embracing a criminal as their symbol. And so for and all let me of interrupt you, you real quick, Eric. Yeah, go for let it. Because I'm still on the soapbox, okay? I'm going to stay on the soapbox. You go ahead and talk, but I'm going to still stand up here because I got more. That That's fine. You might be my height at that point. Uh, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> what I think is important to point out here, because some people are like, oh, it's just, an, it's just a symbol. It's no big deal. When you're elevating those things, symbols matter. Just like people say that on the, go in the opposite direction when we are equating an outlaw with what police are identifying as that is a problem even if it seems subtle and even if you don't realize that oh, that's not what i'm doing but it is you may not realize you're doing that but we do things without being said a lot that's why this is like our police need to be held i like what you said what the the quote from the comic said our police need to be held to the standards of Captain America. Yes. That heroic virtue. Yes. Who is willing to go in to protect and serve. And yep. we should be celebrating Captain America police officers. Yes. Yes. Our Punisher police officers, those are the ones that as Christians, we should not be looking up to. We should not be celebrating because as the creator of the comic said, they are siding with the enemy of the state. Yes. They are siding with the side that we should not be siding with. So to some of you, this conversation, this piece of it may feel a little bit silly because when I first read Eric putting that those in the notes, I felt that too. I'm like, why are we talking about this? But then I thought about it some more and I'm like, the reason this matters is because who we identify as is where our actions come from. Right. That's why as a, as a Christian, I'm such a strong believer in my first identity is in Christ. My first identity is a follower of Jesus. Before my political affiliation, before what country I belong to, before anything else that identifies me, my identity is first and foremost in Christ. And if our police officers are identifying as punisher, that's an issue. Because we need to be celebrating the officers who identify as an agent of the state called to heroic virtue yes. there to protect and serve the people who are made in the image of God. When our police officers are doing that, which is their role under God, under the authority God has given the state, their role is to protect and serve the people God created. We can celebrate them. We can honor them. We can respect them when they're doing that. When they are taking this outlaw punisher role, that's what we cannot be backing as Christians. And it, it, any other situation, you know, and I think we talk about this a lot and I'm going to continue to talk about it. Like you need to use your voice 
if you are in a group, in the in-group, to call out those that are not upholding the values of your in-group. So why do we, and this is going to be a transition, which, you know, I'm just going to tease it for what Jonathan's going to talk about later. Why do we as uh, males, as Christian males, especially like Christian white males, um, call out bad actors of purity culture or call out situations where men have been abusive towards women or us as former, you know, pastors or former, you know, people on, on church staff, why do we call out the, the things that churches do negatively, some churches do negatively to negatively impact uh, their congregation? Because that's what we identify as. And that's what we need to call out because I don't want, I don't, I hate it. When people are like, oh, yeah, modern uh, American even white, ev white American evangelicalism is bad. Ah, I hate that because that's been my identity. Right. Or, um, you know, men and this, not all men. all. I mean, any of those groups that you were in, you would want to call them out. So as a police officer or somebody that supports the police, you should be going, hey, if there's someone out there that's got the Punisher tattoo or the Punisher mentality, we need to call that out. And we need to say, hey, that that kind of stuff, even if you don't mean it, that's not welcome here. That's not appropriate because it would be the same as when somebody says, you know what? All cops, all cops uh, want to be police officers because they want to have power. They're just the high school bullies that peaked in high school because they had the power and now they don't. So now they got a gun and a badge that they get to wield that power now over people. And I would say you know, nine, I don't know. I don't know what percentage, but the majority of police officers that I'm friends with that I know would not identify with that and would hate that to be said about them. But that's what I think you're, you're aligning yourself with when you have that mentality or when you put those symbols or anything else that it's like, Hey, you're just furthering this stereotype that, you know what, instead of being captain America, which I don't think it's a coincidence that captain America's main weapon is what a shield. Yep. It's a, it's an object of protection. Yes. He uses it as offensively, but it's an object of protection because he's there to protect as opposed to going out there and going, the main weapon of the Punisher is a gun. So what I want to see is more Christians that are police officers that take up that mantle, because not only if you're on the thin blue line side, not only do you change the opinions of others to say, Hey, I'm actually here or police are here to protect and serve not to wield power. And the thing that they're protecting, it, you know, they're here to protect citizens and the rights of every person, like our Hulk Hogan, you know, theme song, the rights of every man, they're real Americans. They're not here to protect systems of racism and oppression. That's like, that's the view that I want to be seen. And I want to be said about the police officers that I know that are in my life. And, and that, and, and that only comes if you are on the inside rooting out the negative actors on the other, uh, the negative actors on your in group. As you can probably tell, this conversation could keep going really long. If you want to read more about it, check out Dr. Esau McCauley's book, reading while black. The chapter is incredible. And we left out so much that couldn't fit in. And we're already at almost an hour here. So I want to conclude by just recapping the ways that as Christians, we live in the tension between backing the blue and supporting the police and advocating for justice because it comes down to three areas. As Christians, we are to hold the state responsible for putting in systems that do not exploit people. Number one, number two, we are to remind the state of the limits of its powers and that people are image bearers of God first and we should look to them as such and define systems with that in mind. And thirdly, we should be supporting the police officers who hold to heroic virtue and are champions for the weak while calling out those who abuse their power. Mm -hmm. That is how we live in the tension between these two extremes. That's it for today. If you're listening as this comes out, you know next week is Memorial Day which mm -hmm. Eric hinted at it earlier being the unofficial start of summer. That can only mean one thing. And Eric, what are we talking about next week? We're talking about purity culture and how some men are creeps and need to let, uh, need to let women exist. <clears throat> <laughs>
didn't expect that. I mean, it, that's not it. <laughs> but like, basically, it's like, hey, hey, guys. Base every purity culture. Hey, guys, um, let women exist. Let them have bodies. Let them have clothing on their bodies. And uh, their bodies are not for your uh, visual pleasure uh, or for you to comment on. Uh, yeah, you know, basically is kind of the is like slap. Don't do that. That's kind of what I think when I think of our purity culture is like us just going smack. Stop it. <laughs> Stop to it. Be specific, though. OK, what fine. we're talking about next week is the tension between bouncing our eyes, ah, yeah. which is what most guys were taught growing up. And renewing our mind, which is what Paul tells us to do in Romans. If you have any feedback on this episode or any episode you want to connect with us, Eric is at Eric W712 on all the major platforms. And I am at Jonathan underscore Corona on them as well. We have no clue what social media platforms will still exist by the time you listen to this. So who knows? We're the same on all of them. You can also email us your ideas or thoughts at hello at tensionpodcast.com. If you like the show, do us a favor and rate us and review us wherever you get the podcast or on YouTube. Subscribe there as well or your favorite podcast app if you haven't already. Share this episode with a friend if you found it interesting. And as always, thanks for making us a part of your day. And we will talk to you again next week. I am a real American. Fight for the rights of every man. Everybody, I am a real American. Fight for your Fight rights. For your right. Fight for your Fight life. For your life. Bow, 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 bow. That is the, that just, that song slaps. I don't care. I just, I'm all about that song all the time.